Good evening, your eminences, dear colleagues, friends of uh, the Center of Ecumenical, Missiological and Environmental Studies, Metropolitan Pantheon Papa Georgiou. Some people call it a sad anniversary. I think it's more than remembering a poignant moment. So we remember today a painful moment for the whole world, especially for the Orthodox world, not only because Russia invaded Ukraine, another Orthodox independent state, but especially because the Orthodox Patriarchate of Moscow not only blessed this brother killing war, but this ecclesiastical leadership tried to justify the invasion. But for me, it's a lot more than a question on autocephaly or an ecclesiological approach of a conflict, but foremost, it's an ethical issue and a question how we can talk on unity under the gaze of a bloodshed. So it has fallen to me as president of uh, SEMES to moderate today's open public lecture on the end of orthodox ethics in Russia and lessons for Ukraine. And we're privileged to have with us uh, a well-known speaker and two distinguished professors. So our guest speaker, Emeritus Professor Andriy Krauchuk, is Professor Emeritus of Religious Studies and past president of the University of uh, Sudbury of Canada, author of Christian Social Ethics in Ukraine, co-editor with, uh, along with Thomas Bremer of Eastern Orthodox Encounters of Identity and Otherness, and of Churches in the Ukrainian Crisis in 2017. But he has edited numerous documentary collections on religion, society, and ethics in Eastern Europe, among other things. Our SEMES Foundation dealt during the last two years with the so-called reconciliation regarding ecclesiastical relations in Ukraine from canonical, historical, and theological perspectives. Uh, but along with us, we have also, like I told you, two distinguished professors, Reverend Professor Andrei Duchenko and Professor Moskos, that will also share their viable approach and contributions on uh, today's issue. So, Professor Andrei Grauchuk, the floor is yours. We're listening, we're looking forward to listen what you have to say. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, it's a real privilege to be with you again um, since uh, last year. Um, and to speak, I will just say the title. So, Professor Andrei Grauchuk. Because the uh, title has gone through uh, some changes, uh, so it's as it stands now, it's the end of so uh, orthodox social ethics in Russia and lessons for Ukraine. Um, and uh, before I get into that, I think I want to uh, uh, just uh, briefly come back to uh, Professor Dimitriadis's comment about this day and how it is uh, uh, not an anniversary, it is a commemoration. And we are commemorating, I believe, uh, the, all the people who are suffering and who have lost uh, their lives, who have lost uh, relatives. Um, and I believe it is appropriate uh, to take at least a few uh, uh, seconds to um, honor them with a moment of silence. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, my draft uh, paper, which I've uh, distributed, um, is um, is still a working uh, working version. Uh, it begins with um, rather extensive preliminary notes. I don't think I'll be uh, going through those uh, to begin with. Uh, I can mention a few things uh, if there is time towards the end. Uh, I've already mentioned about the title. Um, and there is some uh, 
concern that I had as I was writing and as I was thinking about the title, what am I, what am I doing here by going back to the uh, social ethics of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church? Why study um, uh, pronouncements that were made more than 20 years ago um, by a church that is associating itself with uh, this war in the way that it has? Uh, so I, there was some very serious doubts about uh, going forward, and I really at one point thought that I would change the topic, uh, but I returned to it, and um, so the result is uh, the present, and I think I'll just get into the um, uh, paper now, uh, the paper proper with the introduction, just a short introductory statement, and, um, and then I'll get into the, uh, the main uh, text. So the social ethics, by social ethics of a religious community, I'm basically referring to uh, the values that that community articulates in words and that it implements in action through the course of its historical interaction with wider social and political uh, context. I think in my last year's presentation, I was talking about a narrative. So in fact, even if that narrative has not been reconstructed yet, it is embedded within the consciousness of that church. And it is just a matter of time before the theologians and the thinkers um, extract this story, this, this chronological, this, this um, coherent narrative of ideas about how the church is not just enclosed in itself within its own walls, and celebrating as a, as a believing community, but how it steps out into the public space, into the, so, into the broader society, and into the uh, political context as well. Um, so Russian Orthodoxy formulated uh, foundational principles of social ethics, as we know in the basis of the social concept, which appeared in the year 2000 and also in the Russian Orthodox basic teaching on human dignity, freedom and rights, which appeared in 2008. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is, is quoting from those documents and, and making comments in light of the uh, invasion on, uh, of Russia into Ukraine on February 24th, 22, and also in the context of uh, Patriarch Kirill's blessing. It is interesting to note that these early documents anticipated many of the urgent questions that have come to the fore uh, concerning in particular the just war and the church's role in the public space. From these foundational statements, we will discuss those elements that are especially relevant to the present war. Um, I want to outline the emerging questions that reveal what I believe is a profound crisis in Russian Orthodoxy. And then finally to draw some lessons, positive lessons for a new Orthodox ethos. Um, and I believe it is already being developed. It is already in process of being uh, articulated inside the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. So first uh, section is called uh, Russian Orthodox Social Ethics, Declarations and Deviations. And again, I begin uh, with a short statement about the um, uh, early social statements and then comments based on uh, the present situation. So 1.1, human dignity. In the Russian Orthodox Church's elaboration of dignity, there is some ambivalence on whether the inherent God-given dignity of every person remains intact and stable under all circumstances, or whether it is vulnerable to moral corruption. On the one hand, the universal quality of dignity is emphatically confirmed as stable regardless of human moral action. And I quote here, a morally undignified life does not ruin the God-given dignity ontologically, but darkens it so much as to make it hardly discernible. This is why it takes so much effort of will to discern and even admit the natural dignity of a villain or a tyrant." End of quote. 
On the other hand, this same ontological dimension of dignity, which supposedly doesn't change at all, can also be cultivated, improved through moral living, or it can be destroyed by immorality. And I quote, I have two quotations here. A human being preserves his God-given dignity and grows in it only if he lives according with moral, in accordance with moral norms. And the second quotation, the image of God can either be darkened or illumined depending on the self-determination of a free individual, while the natural dignity becomes either more apparent in his life or obliterated by sin. The result is directly dependent on the self-determination of an individual. That's from uh, Dignity, Freedom and, uh, and Rights. Now, after 24 February 2022, when the natural dignity of Russia's villainous tyrant was evident to even fewer people than before, the Russian church had an opportunity to explain its notion of ontological darkening and whether it too had detected the presence of a tyrant. I just leave that open. But tyranny or not, according to its own teaching, the church was under no obligation to obey dictates that are harmful from a religious standpoint. This is according to uh, basics of social uh, conscious. The church had recognized the protection of dignity as a good goal. That same church was now silent on the repeated violation of human dignity in the atrocities at Bucha, Irpin, Izum, Mariupol, and elsewhere. One point two: the church's discernment, which is autonomous from the political sphere, it's not determined or predetermined by the state. The Russian church deserve reserved the right to set its own course and independently of political considerations. For one thing, it placed limits, as an example, on ritual blessings in the public space and said that it would deny benediction for the political activity of lay individuals and church organizations involved in election campaigns or political agitation. Similarly, when the decisions of political leaders contradict the church's values, the church confirms the difference, and I quote, and states it publicly in order to avoid confusion and misunderstanding among the faithful and society at large. In its pursuit of and commitment to truth, the church is bound by its responsibility to speak the truth. And I quote now from basis of the social concept, nor has the church the power to fall silent and to stop preaching the truth, whatever other teachings may be prescribed or propagated by state bodies. In this respect, the church is absolutely free from the state, absolutely free from the state, basis of the social concept. By drawing a sharp line between political expectations and its own autonomous reasoning, the Russian church accepted responsibility of critical discernment and of accurate public communication in order to clarify where it stood. So in February, 2022, if the church had differed with the state over the war by its own rationale, it was obliged to speak out publicly against the war. By failing to do that and instead blessing the war, Kirill aligned his moral deliberation and his critical discernment with Putin's regime. And since the church is not a robot or a zombie or a rubber stamp, there could be no confusion about Kirill's conscious and deliberate investment in the war. 1.3. The church's duty to intercede with civil authorities for justice. And I'll just say here, I was speaking with Father Andri before we started, that um, 
This is one of the items that uh, surprised me when I came back to the teaching, the social teaching of the Russian Orthodox Church. I didn't realize that there was this, not the, just the right of the church to intercede, but the duty to intercede in the public sphere with the civil authorities. So the church acknowledged its duty to intercede with the government on behalf of the rights and concerns of citizens and social groups. In fact, we're talking about the kinds of things that were happening in Ukraine during the Maidan. And I'll come back to that. In the past, the church had intervened on behalf of people unjustly convicted, humiliated, uh, exploited, or condemned to death. In the presence of injustice, the church could not be true to its mission in the world as a passive bystander, but only as an advocate for justice. And by fulfilling its duty to intercede, the church affirms its moral mandate in the public sphere. It fulfills its moral responsibility, and by the same token, demonstrates moral accountability. Fully cognizant, fully aware that these were not empty words or declarative posturing, the church confirmed that the moral responsibility was hard and fast, here and now. Today, just as before, we are called to show concern, not only in word, but also in deed, for the protection of human rights and dignity. In 2022, this principle raised questions about the church's moral accountability. Where was its intercession on behalf of civilian victims, women and children subjected to Russian atrocities and violence in Ukraine? Where was its intercession on behalf of Russian troops treated as cannon fodder, Puchich Nemyaso, and executed for refusing to fight? 1.4, the duty of civil disobedience. Again, not the right, not just the right, to take part in public protests, uh, but the duty of the church and its uh, community uh, to undertake civil disobedience. So the church's moral de determinations in the public sphere are not limited to issues in the social order, but extend to the political sphere as well. Here we are talking about laws. We're standing up to laws and disobeying laws. So following from the church's claim of absolute independence from the state, in matters of morality, its social ethic allowed the possibility of disobeying state laws. That point was not hypothetical and specific examples were readily available. For example, the church could never obey an order to renounce the faith, commit apostasy, or to commit sinful and spiritually harmful actions. Presumably other actions or decisions of the state such as those which triggered the uh, church's duty to intercede in the matter of justice, any time an injustice occurred, would also fall under the church's non-compliance, under its civil disobedience. The Russian church extended, therefore, its consideration of, uh, no, so the question there is in 2022, how did Kirill conclude that Russia's war of aggression is not a sinful and spiritually harmful action and that it deserved the church's blessing. Beyond that, the church uh, extended its consideration of civil disobedience to the case of armed conflict, such as the one we have now. There were two types of conflict in the year 2000 in which the church said it cannot support the state or cooperate with it. Number one, waging civil war. Number two, aggressive external war. So the question in 2022, why did the Russian church disregard its own restriction on collaborating with the state in its aggressive external war? I guess, you know, we can anticipate part of the answer, which is to say that, well, they didn't see it as an aggressive uh, external war. Part two, when is a war unjust or just? 2.1, the classic argument of unjust aggression. Um, in inter-ethnic conflicts, the Russian church declared that it would not take sides except when one of the sides commits an evident aggression or injustice. 
So the church recognized its responsibility to analyze conflicts thoroughly enough to know when an evident aggression or injustice has taken place. Basis of the social concept does not say explicitly what happens once unjust aggression is confirmed, but we may presume that the Russian church did not intend knowingly to take the side of an unjust aggressor. Instead, it would denounce injustice. In 2022, as Kirill blessed the war of aggression, which evident aggression or injustice was it that outweighed in his mind the evident aggression and injustice by Putin's Russia? By what reasoning did he side with the unjust aggressor? Was it a case of my country, right or wrong? <clears throat> 2.2, justice and the security of neighbors under threat. Another argument for a just war, another explanation why war may be just in certain circumstances. Justice and the security of neighbors. So basis of the social concept considered um, the uh, justification of war according to biblical and traditional sources. War may be evil, but it becomes a necessary evil. In other words, a just war when the security of neighbors and the restoration of trampled justice are at stake. In 2022, we saw in many discourses how security and justice became trumped up pretext for Putin's war of aggression. Supposedly, Russia had no alternative but to protect itself because Ukraine was allegedly on the verge of attacking it and Russian speakers in as yet unoccupied territories were told that they were treated unfairly. For added spiritual security and the protection from the wrath of the uh, Almighty, a curious strategy was devised in case the necessary evil should turn out to be an unjust war. Maybe even God would not see the war for what it was, as long as Putin and Kirill called it by another name, special operation. And if the will of the people could be crafted, by threatening citizens of Russia with seven years in prison for using the word war. I'm skipping over a section here and going straight into ethical engagement in war, point 2.4. Um, and here we're talking about uh, how the determination of whether a war is or is not unjust hinges on how that war is conducted, what are the rules and what are the uh, practices uh, on the ground. So we have restrictions on permissible military violence, which um, go back all the way to medieval Christianity and the Russian church uh, takes account of them. Um, and those restrictions include love of one's neighbors, nation and fatherland, understanding the needs of other nations and the rejection of immoral means in serving one's country. In 2022, the Russian church either renounced its commitment to the love of neighbors or it reserved that love only to Russians. In either case, there was willful ignorance of Jesus's parable in response to the question, who is my neighbor? and its deliberate subversion. In other words, the biblical every man, whoever is in need is your neighbor, is replaced by a clannish ethnic tribesman. I will only help my own. Long before any talk of Ruski Mir, this is likely, perhaps, where the roots of philatism may be found. As for understanding, much less considering the needs of other nations, in light of 2022, there's only one possible explanation, that the Russian Orthodox Church discarded that principle as irrelevant, subordinate to, to larger purposes. The just war theory of Western Christianity also developed a number of conditions under which a war could be conducted in a morally permissible way, 
and as noted in uh, Basis of the Social Concept, these included a principle of proportionality. In other words, foreseeable military losses and destruction should never exceed the purpose of the war. And another principle was that of the protection of civilians from direct hostilities. So long before Geneva, you know, Western Christianity is uh, making these proposals for a just war. In 2022, Kirill aligns his position on the purpose of the war with Putin's. The war was necessary to protect Russia from an imagined threat in Ukraine, fascism, democracy, the West, whatever, NATO. But as the toll of casualties and destruction mounted in the course of 2022, where was Kirill to ask Putin about the limits of proportional killing and devastation? Where was Kirill? who co-authored the basis of the social concept to point out that from his church's perspective, no war could be just if the number of losses was completely ignored and the victims of Russian aggression were dehumanized and abused. And even Russian soldiers were no more than cannon fodder as we have mentioned. Where was he when by his own directives, it was time to say enough. Basis of the social concept considers the difficulty, it's not that easy to distinguish between a defensive war, a just war, and a war of aggression. Particularly when a state or states initiate hostilities and claim a duty to protect victims of aggression. In 2022, the idea of a duty to protect became a convenient instrument for justifying Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Official state and patriarchal uh, justifications of the war included the trope of an imagined persecution of Russians living in Ukraine, especially in the Donbass region. Allegedly, they were prevented from speaking, in Ru speaking Russian or praying in Russian. According to Putin and Kirill, this triggered a Russian obligation to protect victims, and it overrode international norms, Ukrainian sovereignty, territorial integrity. It became the basis for Russia's assumed right to launch a war of aggression and for the Russian church's decision to march in lockstep with the Kremlin. And I'll move into the uh, final section, um, concluding remarks, which I call the state of Russian orthodoxy and an alternative path for orthodoxy in Ukraine. So in this critical review, and I've only um, taken sections from the larger uh, paper, uh, this critical review of the Russian Orthodox understanding of its social responsibility in the public forum and its ethical positions on war. We have compared official statements from 2000 and 2008 with the church's blessing and justification of Putin's war uh, in 2022 on a matter of utmost moral significance. Great discrepancies are evidenced between the church's declared ideals and its decisions and actions in the first year of the war. The depth and the extent of the ethical, spiritual, and ontological crisis that this represents for the Russian church place it arguably beyond the reach of mere accusations or condemnations. Instead of mudslinging, an accurate assessment of the objective reality can inform, I believe, the social political diagnosis from which a constructive alternative ecclesiology can emerge. So the concluding remarks address two questions. Where does the foregoing discussion leave Russian orthodoxy? And second, what lessons can be drawn from it to formulate a constructive path for an alternative orthodox ethos in Ukraine. So as with the failed pariah state that chose isolation 
over international relations, the Russian church that aligned with it was on a path of self-isolation for a long time before 24 February, 2022. Crete in 2016 and Amman in 2020 were only two episodes in a seditious pattern of behavior. The conscious abdication in practice of its own declared social ethic is no small incident in the sad narrative of Russian Orthodoxy, the church's renunciation of its responsibilities in the public sphere, the duty to protect human dignity, to intercede with civil authorities, to practice civil disobedience in the name of justice, to recognize and condemn an unjust war, and to protect civilians and provide humane treatment for war prisoners shocked not only external observers, but its own members too. Some called for remedial uh, canonical measures, but the scale of the problem may well exceed the capacity of any known disciplinary, punitive, restorative, or pastoral remedies. It's not for me to say, but I open it for, for discussion. Um, it certainly is greater than any one individual's inadvertent mistake or doctrinal error or even heresy, potentially even greater than an entire institution's estrangement or loss of communion. We have to, we have to bring back Russian Orthodoxy into communion. Um, for one thing, fraternal correction would probably be futile in the present situation. It, 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 extend, it, it, it exceeds the scope of fraternal correction. Oh, by the way, you're on the wrong track as would excommunication or anathemas, that, those would be contra counterproductive. Nor in this ecclesiological crisis can there be much point to a formal accusation from outside. I mean, my comments uh, are really more directed towards positive proposals for the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. But by its actions and omissions, the church has placed itself into a very difficult situation. We may call it uh, uh, self-accusation. And only it can decide to move through the steps of the necessary catharsis. So the intended purpose or telos, the end of Russian social or telos, had real potential in theory, but like Stalin's constitutions, which were hailed internationally for their stylistic beauty and legal wisdom, it was either ignored or subverted in practice. It just was not visible on the ground. So the outcome in 2022 was a disaster for the whole church. And we can only follow from the sidelines to see how much deeper this entity will continue to fall. Now, the description of a dismal situation uh, of ecclesial, uh, uh, an ecclesial situation can have perhaps a positive side if it points towards a new way of being orthodox in Ukraine, where something new is happening. It imposes nothing, but suggests maybe that some lessons can be learned, which can strengthen principles that the Orthodox Church of Ukraine is already implementing. Learning from mistakes and developing best practices can potentially pave the way to a new mode of Orthodox well-being, not just ontological being, but well-being in Ukraine. In fact, that would be not so much a new direction, but a further elaboration of what was born at the Maidan, a new theological and ecclesial consciousness, a social ethics of liberation in which the clerical church, remember Father Hoborun told us that the church was not first there, they came and they joined the people. So the institutional church joins its people, the social organism, in calling the government to account and in naming the values which should and will be defended in the public sphere, truth, justice, equality, social responsibility, accountable governance, democratization, and dignity. At risk of repeating some items from a previous reflection, like paper from last year, um, I uh, uh, 
proposed uh, seven uh, ideas, seven reflections that may provide uh, some food for um, thought in this area. So in an alternative mode of orthodox being, or we may call it an alternative orthodox ethos in Ukraine, number one, the church would not become a department of the state, would not aspire to become a state church, even after it achieves the status of undisputed majority religious community in Ukraine, it would continue to support religious equality and not preferential treatment. Number two, the church would distance itself from odious figures of oligarchy and corruption. Uh, just to cite two examples, we have Pasha Mercedes or Mercedes as it's pronounced in Ukraine, uh, Deacon Novinsky and the like. Uh, it's not about the individuals, it's the, it's, the, it's the practice and the association with that entire system, uh, which, um, which was really a cancer on the uh, political system and kept Ukraine from developing its full potential after its independence. Number three, the church would read the Bible accurately and analytically, not childishly, and it would avoid falling victim to manipulation in the service of political agendas. I have a footnote there about one example, but in the in the longer version of the paper, I am I was quite surprised to see uh, just simply a misreading of the Bible in in basis of the social concept and and so forth. Quotations being brought which which have nothing to do with the um, intended text. So we need to uh, go back to the sources with uh, greater uh, precision and uh, academic quality, I think, of analysis. Number four, the church would work systematically to root out and reject Russophobia. I understand how difficult, probably next to impossible, this would be. Um, but I also observe uh, people like um, Metropolitan uh, Alexander Drabinko, who, um, when, when he's being interviewed and people say, you know, uh, death to the enemy, smerit poraham, you know, he, he kind of does not follow, follow that. He says, you know, may the, the judgment of the Almighty uh, be, uh, be uh, the deciding factor, not, not our own hatred. So the reasoning, of course, is, is self-evident. To embrace hatred would be counterproductive. It would only imitate the fallen church, uh, and uh, uh, it would be to fail in the same way. Uh, alternatively, the alternative perspective is for the church to teach and to deconstruct a number of delusions, and I give them here, related to this. Number one, that the church can be the servant of nationalists, some people don't understand that in Ukraine. Secondly, that ethnophobic hatred can be proof of patriotism. And we have tendencies in that direction from time to time. And I think the church plays an important role in, in making those corrections. And third, that a Ukrainian speaking mirror image of the Russian Orthodox Church. So we do everything the same, but we do it in the Ukrainian language, that's not that's not a credible or legitimate alternative that we're talking about here. It's 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 an alternative orthodox ethos. Number five, the church would resist hegemonic agendas that impose one culture as a, uh, superior to another. Having an official language does not mean that other cultures are less equal in the same country. Number six, the church would recognize its role and responsibility to participate in the public forum of civil society, recognize that it has duties in support of social justice and it fulfills those duties with responsibility and accountability. If a mistake is made, it is admitted. If a mistake is made and it is corrected, the church accepts that correction. And finally, Sobornist, and I put the I there because I think we're going to Ukrainianize uh, a little bit, or maybe there will be other terms to express the same notion. In addition to its public accountability and beyond 
sacramental ministry or pastoral ministry that uh, uh, the clergy uh, uh, and the episcopate performs, church leadership is accountable to its members, clergy and laity, who, account, who participate in democratic governance and decision-making. And I was watching quite a number of these uh, controversial uh, you know, transitions from uh, uh, the Moscow Patriarchate to the uh, Orthodox Church of Ukraine. And so you have recorded videos of these uh, acts of transfer um, demonstrating this, uh, the, the way that the decision-making is taking place. It's uh, in many cases, it's not only the priests, but it's uh, the people taking participatory roles in uh, very important decisions. Um, so with inclusive governance, a governance that includes the laity and the clergy, not just the bishops, transparency and accountability, the hierarchical structure would never deceive or betray its people with secret allegiances or hidden agendas. Well, we're with Moscow, but we're going to say we're not with Moscow. Um, you know, that, that would be impossible if you have the proper uh, uh, distribution of uh, governance and responsibility. Such governance can ensure also that when a crisis looms, something is, is critically happening inside the church, it can be detected, reported, and resolved at all levels well in advance. Everybody's in the same boat, the same interest. And such governance and crisis management can prevent the kind of catastrophe and desperate solutions, too little too late, that are the signs of a church in free fall. Now, I'm looking at the time, so I've completed the, uh, the, the abbreviated uh, you know, presentation. Uh, Professor Dimitriadis, uh, there, there are a few remarks that I made in the uh, you know, preliminary remarks, but I think maybe they can uh, be uh, elaborated if necessary in the discussion. So I want to leave time for questions, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Krauzuk, for a very clear presentation, very clear points, uh, mainly the, the, uh, your uh, uh, seven proposals in the end, which also I think uh, uh, both Professor uh, Adri Duchenko and Professor Moskos, along with Professor Vasiliadis, that is also following the discussion with the comment on that. Uh, I would like also to thank you for uh, keeping this moment of silence, which I also had to do in the, in the beginning, and uh, let me also share the thing that when we've been discussing before the uh, live streaming about uh, whether it's uh, uh, the remembering of this, uh, it's not an anniversary, you, you said very uh, clearly that an anniversary would be when this war will, uh, will uh, over, will, uh, will, will, will end. So thank you for, for that as well. So briefly, uh, uh, my role is to give the word um, Let's start with, uh, uh, I don't know if someone wants to, to be first, either Professor uh, Reverend uh, Andriy Duchenko or Professor Moskos, it's up to you. Let's say Professor Duchenko, since the pro program was, 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 was uh, your name was first. Okay. So, thank yeah. you. I, I, first, I would like to thank uh, Professor Andriy Kravchuk for a brilliant presentation, very well elaborated and uh, showing uh, very clearly how uh, our uh, fellow brothers from Russian Orthodox Church contradict their own statement that was made officially by their church authorities. Uh, and uh, it reminds me uh, that the, the year has passed uh, just from the today, the day when the full scale invasion began, Last year and the whole year passed, uh, we, we um, have seen uh, from the Russian side, uh, from the Russian church side, all this kind of, um, how to say, it's not just a lie. I, I'm not sure, do they believe what, what they're saying or not? But for me, it is as like uh, was very well described in the famous novel uh, um, 1984 by George Orwell. Uh, novelist, which is now banned in uh, Russian Federation, as you probably know. Uh, and it's a sign of uh, some mutation of mind, probably, uh, kind of illness. And um, 
I think it's very much connected with the ideology of so-called Russian world, Ruski Mir, which was um, elaborated since the beginning of uh, Patriarch Kirill, uh, uh, when Kirill became Patriarch in the 20, uh, 20, 2008, 2009, sorry. So, as was um, published at the very, very beginning uh, at the pro propaganda of Ruski Mir, I remember one article published in the uh, theological site, theological website of Moscow Patriarchate, very nice website, Bogoslov, the theologian.ru. It was an article by Father Ephemius Moisev, now he's a bishop in, in Moscow Patriarchate, when he articulated the idea that uh, Russian, Russian people is a kind of super ethnos. Russian world, he said, is mono-ethnic, despite uh, uh, it includes uh, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and uh, people from every nation who is Russian-speaking. But in this uh, idea, this concept, it was uh, formulated like uh, the Russian world is mono-ethnic and mono-confessional, and this world includes only one super ethnos, the Russian super ethnos, and the only one confession, Russian orthodoxy. And uh, it's interesting to note that the confession was named by the author not as orthodoxy, but Russian orthodoxy. It was very fundamental for this idea. And um, then he continues uh, to say that the local churches, he say, is identified as the church of this or that people, not as a church located on this or that territory. So the Russian church is a church for all Russian, all Russian speaking, all Russian ethnos in the world. And when these false ideas grow and um, became very common, I mean, not only the idea of super ethnos, but the idea of, of this Russian world propaganda and uh, the idea that we are coming to Ukraine not to invade, but to um, uh, support Russian speaking here to protect uh, people who are struggling from so-called Nazis. Uh, we do not know who are, these Nazis are in Ukraine. We have no, no, no one in Ukraine have seen them for, for decades. But uh, according to their view, probably this have this kind of, of mind, illness of mind. Uh, also, I would like to comment, uh, uh, Professor Kravchuk uh, said that uh, uh, one of the idea of invasion was imagined persecution of Russians living in Ukraine. It's true, especially in Donbass and in uh, southern Ukraine, in Russian-speaking regions, especially in Donbass region. Uh, uh, they uh, were so-called, they were prevented from speaking and praying in Russian. It's also interesting to note that in uh, Moscow Patriarchate, uh, you can hardly find any parish uh, with Russian, Russian language of worship. Uh, most of parishes are Church Slavonic. Uh, in Ukraine, in Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine, also the churches uh, use Church Slavonic language. And it is interesting that it is in the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, former Kievan Patriarchate, former kind of schismatic church, not of Moscow Patriarchate, that in um, Kherson region, in southern uh, part of Ukraine, there were a certain number, not one, but certain several parishes, about a dozen or so parishes, with the Russian language as the main uh, language for worship. It was uh, uh, until the beginning of the full-scale invasion. When the full invasion began, the activity of the Ukrainian church on occupied territories was completely impossible. It was banned because on occupied territories, the only religion is uh, permitted, it's a uh, uh, Russian Orthodox Church. Neither Ukrainian Orthodox, nor Greek Catholics, uh, nor Protestant churches are not allowed to be, to celebrate, to worship publicly on the occupied territories. 
So then uh, I am especially very thankful for Professor Karavchuk for his proposals for the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Yes, it's uh, important. And sometimes I understand that it can be difficult for many of us to accept certain points here. And as for me, it's extremely important to understand for us to realize as the church, for us as the church to realize that we should not try to become a department of state, uh, how it's formulated, not try to have a special, special support, special privileges from the state. Uh, because as far as I observe, for the recent decades before the war, uh, when the church are fighting each other, you know, it was about 20 or more than 20 years of uh, almost 30 years of church competition here, that um, each uh, Orthodox jurisdiction uh, was um, trying to obtain certain privileges from the government, from civil authorities. And it's not easy for us, probably we are poisoned by this kind of Byzantine mind, this idea of symphony, which uh, is transformed sometimes into idea that uh, state should uh, give us some privileges, we should preach openly, we should have some financial support from the state, and church and the state should help us to ban other our uh, competitive churches how to say, other, other uh, jurisdictions or denominations. Well, uh, the last, probably I would li like to accent that, um, yes, uh, Professor Karchuk said about duties uh, with responsibility and accountability that we as a church should realize and, uh, and understand and, uh, and show this. Also, it's very important. Uh, and also, I'm afraid that uh, our church is not so ready for this proposal. Uh, and sometimes, yes, you are right that uh, sometimes to be a Ukrainian church, for, for, for some people, it's only just to translate what we accepted from Russian, from Moscow Patriarchate, just to translate it into Ukrainian. It's a temptation for us, and uh, I I hope that we as a church uh, should find strength to overcome this. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. I do not have a question. I just mm -hmm. uh, the only my question is uh, I think we need to just to have some shortened version of this text in Ukrainian uh, to translate this and to promote this into Ukrainian media. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Duchenko. I don't know if you want to... Now, let's pass to Professor Moskos uh, now, and then uh, I will give the, word, the floor again to Professor Kortz. Professor Moskos, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it is really a delight and an honor to, uh, to hear uh, this very interesting lecture from Professor Kravchuk. Uh, I have to admit that it's my... Um, uh, well, I'm uh, also from... From the from the viewpoint of of a specialist, I'm a, a Czech historian, but I'm not, you know, I'm not specialized in this in this um, uh, um, um, world of of of, of um, uh, um, um, uh, important um, evolution within uh, the Slavic lands, and which is Christianity has an a, 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 um, a certain history of, of its own, and it's very important to see how these uh, these things are addressed uh, from inside. So it was a very uh, not only interesting but a very balanced and very practical um, input. I think this this lecture. Uh, it is difficult for us from so outside uh, outside to 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 um, uh, to see in that uh, in more detail. But I can understand from outside as. Uh, how this? Uh, how can I perceive this this reality, which is really very difficult after the outbreak of of the invasion uh, the last year, because we have we had already um, a, a a growing problem in the way that um, um, 
to the Moscow Patriarchate um, understood its uh, mission, its place in the world, um, mainly through the catalyst of the of the uh, of the convoking the uh, the, the synod, the uh, uh, the Holy Synod of Crete uh, in 2016, which was a very very important turning point. Uh, I I heard for the first time in Erfurt about the Ruski Mir, about the Russian world as an ecclesiological category, which was actually very outrageous because I couldn't, I, it was, well, I didn't realize up to that, that it's actually a certain uh, category of, uh, of certain way of categorizing the Christian world, the Orthodox Christian world, saying that we have the old patriarchates and we have the autocephalic churches, which is a national, a, 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 um, a product of nationalism in the 19th, 19th century, and we have the the Russian world, which is something totally different. That was new for me, actually. And so I tried to, to understand what is this, what lies behind that. Um, I think there is a certain um, combination of, of, of the um, uh, of the uh, of, of the of the um, uh, of the capacity having a, a big, um, you know, this having a, a, a huge numbers um, in the uh, in the in the Russian uh, jurisdiction. This is one thing, and then also the idea of uh, um, uh, internalizing a sort of mission that actually um, uh, 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 Russian Orthodoxy is uh, the Moscow Patriarchate is actually at the, at the top. Of a certain campaign against against the um, um, the, the uh, um, uh, against the corrupted and declined Western set set of values. This, this gave some. Uh, this gave some Okay. I hope that it's a uh, This is all very interesting, but we have to carry on. So, <laughs> so <laughs> this is yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Yes. So it is um <clears throat> Uh, it is. Um, uh, uh, it it was it was very, it was very um, peculiar that uh, all this. If I understood it well you, at your lecture, Professor Kralchuk, uh, there were some important points at the at the, at the declarations of, of the Russian Church before, and they were actually um, um, somehow ignored or uh, transformed. Uh, vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the last uh, war situation with the, with the invasion. And it's, it's very interesting how that happened. I think this, the, there was a culmination of the, in, that, uh, in that idea of the campaigning against uh, the degenerous West. And so we have to, um, in a way, we have to, uh, to, find, we have to find a path to, to, um, uh, to solve this problem first. I mean, to 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 uh, sit down and, and and discuss what is the, um, the 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 position of of the Orthodox Church in this modern world? That is, it's a discussion that uh, it was uh, we, in other in other countries like like Greece, we're forced to do that actually. And I think that uh, there are also uh, uh, we see the same problem also in in Western countries uh, where Orthodox people live there. So it's important to um, to readdress this this issue. <clears throat> How what does it mean to live in a, uh, um, in, a in a in a uh, modern society and to show these things? What, for example, ontological dignity means um, <clears throat> living in a, um, um, in a in a in a, a society which is actually where um, the uh, the uh, the self the self uh, orientation in uh, socially or, or sexually or another another uh, point of view means. So it's important to, to discuss about that and see if orthodoxy can live in this in this um, context because uh, I think this is the, the way that the, the, the discourse of the of the uh, uh, 
um, of the people that um, are aligned with the Moscow Patriarchate. I, I, I recently saw a book, The Moralist International. So it's not it's not only Russia, but it's it's uh, this it is this this um, um, international alliance against uh, all these ideas. Some in Greece also this. These these people, these Putin first days, and then all these all these uh, people that actually um, start from a um, from an idea that uh, there is something something fundamentally wrong uh, in Western um, in the Western world. So so we cannot uh, uh, work in this. We have to confront this only. This is the only way to to live in a modern society. And this lies behind. Um, Probably uh, ideas of, of justificating, uh, just justifying uh, the war, or talking about just war, which is always already a very difficult uh, uh, situation. Of course, uh, politically, it's it's of course something different because we can we can discuss politics about West and East and so on uh, forever. But uh, what concerns us concerns us is how the uh, inside, how the, the Orthodox. Ecclesiastical discourse and the, the Orthodox ecclesiastical um, uh, uh, system of of of, uh, of uh, showing of manifesting the unity, meaning, namely uh, the so uh, the um, sobornost or sobor sobornist sobornist, uh, you said. Um, so the idea that how can we uh, um, live uh, um, uh, um, in a synthesis. And at the same time, manifesting the unity of the one church under the Holy Spirit. So this um, uh, this is this is very important not to do it from you know from, from uh, you said very very um, uh, that was very wise not from outside but trying to um, to to, um, to develop a sort of of um, of a path of um, uh, this discussion path of dialogue. In order to do this, which is very difficult, so um, um, I think uh, these things were well said. But we have to to point out that we have to to detach them from the uh, from the um, very nasty, very very sad political context of the moment. I mean, uh, the war and the invasion, all of this, all these things. But we have to keep in mind that uh, we are not the first in the first world war. The participants were actually, in their majority, were Roman Catholics, and they, um, um, they it was all, the, the, the First World War had also religious connotations, although we, we forget that today. But at that time, for the uh, for the for the for each nation was a sort of uh, God's mission or something like that uh, to fight the opponent. But in the end, after so, of course, after so many millions of, of dead and so on, there was a, um, um, a fundamental discussion be began in, in, within the, the, the Catholic Church with the, uh, the help of, 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 of uh, uh, the Eucharistic ecclesiology and all these things that eventually led to a uh, certain evolution in the Second Vatican and so on. So it's. I hope that in, in the Orthodox Church that um, will be the, the, the tragic pretext, I can say, the tragic uh, catalyst that can discuss on a global scale uh, at, at last about the um, the way that we live within this the, uh, on this this planet and uh, uh, facing all these difficult um, uh, problems and environmental problems and other ones that. Others that that uh, concern all people, all all the planet, um, and um, 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 serving, se addressing this problem and serving the, the rest of the humanity with dia diaconia, orthodox diaconia, in a very um, proper and very um, and, 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 and a, a, a viable way. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Moschos. Um, I have, I don't know, with, uh, I have just one question in the internet for you. Uh, Professor Krauts, then I will give you directly the floor. Is it okay with you? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Professor Dimitris Karendas from Rome, uh, he's thanking you and the commentators, and he's asking 
If it's, is it realistic to have a pan-Orthodox declaration against all forms of nationalism, or how should we overcome the standard Orthodox idea of nation? Mm -hmm. And since I, I, I'm the moderator and I have to do it, there were also some comments which I will, I will forward them uh, to all. Actually, are visible in the YouTube, but I don't think I would like to comment them right now. So, Professor Krautschuk, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, all uh, for taking time and uh, for kindly uh, participating and thinking along with me. Uh, I have to say, I think maybe in my introductory remarks, which I didn't read, uh, or pre my preliminary notes, uh, there was a sense, which I want to state now, that uh, uh, all of these reflections are very uh, tentative. Uh, it's very humbling to, to sit down and to try to make uh, some sense of what is going on. And that is basically all I'm trying to do. I, I, I constantly, uh, in fact, I believe I came to the conclusion that there is not much use in issuing judgments. You know, it's not my place, first of all, I'm not qualified, I'm not, the nobody's going to listen to a judgment and it's not gonna make any difference. I think the value of uh, the reflection can be maybe in the direction that I took towards the end of some proposals of lessons that can be learned. Um, even those, uh, according to Father Andri, um, you know, uh, some of them are, are difficult or maybe controversial or maybe the church is not ready for them yet. Um, you know, I, I, again, also proposing them only for discussion, only uh, as things that occurred to me that, that may have some, that may have some uh, uh, constructive uh, uh, value if, if they are further elaborated. And um, again, as with, um, as with the Russian church, which I believe is, is the only entity that can face its own I, I dare to call it a crisis uh, without judgment. Uh, you know, nobody is going to tell it how to fix its uh, problems. And likewise, no one is going to tell the Orthodox Church of Ukraine how to um, consolidate itself, how to develop its theology, a consistent theology, how it's going to work out its social ethic in other words, it's, it's um, you know, interaction with uh, communities, not just Christian communities, but the general Christian public. What will be that place of that church and how will it relate to uh, the different governments, one after another, that get elected? What will its, you know, public face be um, in the thing? So these are, uh, you know, very, very humbly presented uh, ideas. Um, I think, uh, just getting back to something that uh, Father Andri was mentioning about um, uh, Symphonia, again, I think uh, when the conversation takes place uh, inside of um, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, I think, I think uh, that uh, people who are engaging in that conversation will realize that this is not just some abstract idea taken from remote history, you know, Byzantium or something. This is a particular manifestation or incarnation that has taken place in Russia. Um, and we have an example of how things can go very, very wrong. Um, so that has to be part of the, the you know, reflection uh, about what the future will be in um, Ukrainian orthodoxy. I think, I think um, it's, it's, um, it's helpful uh, to, um, uh, to consider the, 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 uh, uh, the state of uh, Russian orthodoxy as, um, you know, a... Uh, uh, an example of, of uh, some good ideas, which, which uh, you know, are, are very solid. And for example, the 
church's sense of social responsibility, not just the right to have its voice heard in, in the public forum, but it's Christian responsibility. So it, so it fulfills a responsibility in the social and political orders. It can make mistakes as a human institution. It can make mistakes and accountability to me means that it can be corrected by its own members or by, mem or by people from the broader society. And it can admit, yes, we were wrong. We're going to change our course. So in other words, it's not um, an ecclesiology which, which affirms some kind of infallibility or, or, or holiness. It, it recognizes its human side as well. And in that human capacity, it is open to um, self-criticism, which, which would also be a principle that, uh, that, could, be, that could be usefully developed. Um, to Professor Moskos, thank you so much for, um, uh, you began by saying you're not a specialist, only a historian and so on, but you ended off by, by actually giving exactly the kind of uh, examples, you know, that, that we need from history uh, to put things into perspective, how, how a crisis, uh, when we are in the midst of a crisis, we, we really may not be able to um, imagine the solutions because we, we have not yet fully grasped everything that is going on around us. We don't understand the meaning of, of all of this. The, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine is just, you know, of course they didn't appear from nothing. They existed for a long time, but in the, in the sense of an, a recognized institution with the Tomos and Autocephaly and so they're a baby. So, so there's a lot of creative potential that can go in there. And, and so the discussions uh, that hopefully uh, will take place will be very um, constructive. And, and uh, I think people realize, uh, you know, without having to be told that uh, uh, I think the Orthodox world is following very, very closely, you know, the developments uh, in uh, Orthodox Church of Ukraine to see, you know, whether it is possible. I think that's partially an answer to the question of, um, you know, nationalism or the church's relationship with, um, you know, ethnic identity, you know, that whole spectrum that ends on one side with philatism and, and begins uh, on the other side with, with straightforward uh, patriotism, you know, which is, which is completely, uh, you know, acceptable and so forth, but you have a spectrum. Um, and so it requires uh, critical discussion and, and uh, elaboration. And I think that, uh, thank you so much for saying uh, that, uh, that you thought my presentation was balanced. I have to, I have to uh, uh, say that, that it is a struggle. I can see places. Uh, I don't know if some of the comments are, are criticizing that, but um, places in which my, um, my, what shall we say, convictions or my emotions, you know, uh, uh, are showing. I, I did not use the official name of the uh, uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate. I did not use Ukrainian Orthodox Church. I have switched since the war and I, because I will not confuse people by saying Ukrainian Orthodox Church. I will say the Russian Church in Ukraine, you know, uh, it, and it's clear. So, you know, they can have official names and so forth, but um, this, is my, this is my bias, you know, uh, I'm taking sides. Uh, again, hopefully in the, interest of, in the interest of balance, I'm not trying to, to my, my accusations are irrelevant. My judgments are of, you know, an institution are irrelevant. But I think we need to critically analyze. We need to, as you say, um, you know, detach from the nasty, uh, sad kind of uh, level uh, at which things uh, are and try to uh, engage. I personally do not see where, uh, uh, I, I, you know, outside uh, help can be. It, it's really largely, there are very positive signs. We know the protests of priests and so forth. Uh, we know actually uh, Father Andri was uh, in earlier this month in a, in a meeting uh, with the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, to try to get some uh, dialogue going uh, at uh, at uh, an initial stage, I think that's very very positive. 
Uh, I'm in touch with uh, Sergei Chapnin, who hopefully will also have comments on my paper, who recently wrote an open letter to try to, you know, uh, make proposals for uh, the church that he is still a member of. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, it's, 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 very, it's very humbling because there's so many things going on, uh, very positive things. Um, uh, and um, we are not yet, I mean, a historian will appreciate that we, will, we are not yet near, anywhere near, uh, uh, you know, a position of saying, oh, here is where we actually are. And here is where you know we need we need more, more time, more more uh, kind of distance in time uh, uh, to be able to uh, to say what we're doing. But I think, you know, from a theological perspective, uh, we can identify questions, very serious questions. We can, um, uh, as I tried towards the end here, to make some kind of uh, proposals and uh, do so only in the spirit of discussion and critique. You know, uh, uh, I cannot uh, sit in isolation. Isolation is not the solution. You know, we have to, we have to present it in, in, in dialogue. And I think together there is a possibility if we have sustained theological discussion uh, about goals, about what is possible, about what we can tell our people, what we can tell our community, about what is maybe not possible because of this psychological impact of the war on people, you know, they, they're simply not ready to hear certain things. So we say, okay, we're going to go easy on that and we'll wait for, and of course, as you say, you know, the, the war itself is a largely determinative factor. Things will change. The situation and the possibilities for constructive action will change when the war is over. We are still in the war and, and, and that places real limits on what, um, on what we can uh, be expected realistically to, um, uh, to do. But um, I, I, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to, um, to be with you today and to, and to hear some comments. I think Father Andri has uh, maybe some more thoughts. Yeah, 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 I'll give a little bit of floor to, uh, to Father Andre. Thank you very much for the honesty and for clarifying your already clarified uh, uh, lecture. Father Andre, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, dear Professor Kravchuk. Uh, you said uh, about uh, the name of the church, uh, of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, that you are referring to it now as the Russian uh, Orthodox Church in Ukraine, just to make things clear, as I understand, yes? And also you mentioned uh, the dialogue between uh, clergy from uh, Orthodox Church of Ukraine and Ukrainian Orthodox Church. That we had uh, two offline meetings already. And uh, I think that uh, your uh, seven proposals uh, from your presentation uh, could help to find a basis for dialogue. Mm. Basis probably in, in, in some sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just uh, like to add very few things that uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church uh, is a complex uh, structure with a certain very pro-Russian wing, but they also have a large number of uh, pro-Ukrainian patriotic uh, priests and parishes. And some of my friends from uh, uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church who participated in this dialogue, they would uh, disagree completely disagree with, the, like you say, the name Russian Orthodox Church referring to them. Because uh, since uh, May 27, Council at uh, Feofania, they uh, believe, they believe, they some of them really believe that they broke any connection with Moscow. I, I not agree with it, but I see how many of them truly believe that it happened. Despite the fact that uh, in Kiev, for example, we still have we still have some parishes and monasteries in the very center of Kiev that continue to commemorate the name of Patriarch Kirill at the services at the senior archbishop, and uh, Metropolitan Anufri gave uh, uh, oral permission for this. We all know this. 
so it's complicated and one more thing that i would like to add it's about another another just to illustrate your uh, list of theses how russian uh, behavior of russian uh, uh, church uh, government and uh, church authorities and uh, russian soldiers contradict what is proclaimed in uh, the official documents just uh, one uh, one uh, illustration i'm here now in my house it's near hostomel airport just one house one one mile from runway of hostomel airport that was taken by russians uh, a year ago the very same day and um, i was in occupation here about two weeks 16 days and uh, on on 16 day here i met a russian priest who came with military forces a kind of chaplain russian who came with with the russians and we had a discussion on the street uh, near my house and um, in this discussion he said very clear he said literally uh, God has revealed me that Russia is on the right side in this war. It was his uh, words. God revealed me, he said. So they do really believe? In what God do they believe, we may ask? Because their temple in Russia, military temple, they cannot refer to it building as a church, rather temple, temp probably to Marsus, God, God of war, or I do not know, know which God, but then when I was uh, escaped from here to my to, to Kiev, and I read internet and some discussions, and then was discovered uh, those atrocities in Bucha. Bucha is just uh, eight kilometers from here to Kiev, very clear, very very close to here, and some um, uh, on internet some people uh, suggested that. If uh, probably Russians uh, would come here with chaplains, they would not make so much uh, these atrocities, so much uh, evil that they, they did make. But uh, they came with chaplains. They came with. And as, as uh, far as I observed here, I, I saw several Russian soldiers here, very young men, about 20 years old, and they were not really motivated in the war. I saw that they were not clear understand what the reason uh, uh, for, for being them here. But this uh, priest was highly motivated, highly motivated. And I suggest that the mission is for, for priests here was to encourage Russian troops, Russian soldiers, do what they did. Thank you. Thank you. If, if I may just quickly uh, comment to the first part having to do with terminology. Um, my, my choice of, of uh, using something that is uh, transparent uh, to refer to the church which is, remains in affiliation with the Moscow Patriarchate because that is its only um, canonical claim that it has, otherwise it's a non-canonical church, if it, if it severs ties with Moscow um, and doesn't unite with another church. Um, I th one of the things that I'm becoming aware of, I think I may have been mentioning it to you before in discussion, is that whatever we say in the West about what is going on in Ukraine, it's, there's a different language being used. In Ukraine, I can use Orthodox Church of Ukraine, and everyone will understand that I, which church I'm talking about. You know, Petsa U and Upetsa, this is, this is standard currency in Ukraine. In the West, when we are dealing with audiences that are not intimately aware of, of these terms, um, I, I simply made the choice literally for clarity. Also, it's it's my bias, you know, to call the spade. To we, we need to call things uh, by their proper names, as we have learned over the past year from many people uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so I think that was uh, that was the accommodation. If I was speaking in Ukraine, of course I would I would use uh, pizza u and upetsa. You know, there's no question. I mean, uh, these are things that are self understood. Also, I think there are some comments that people want me to be in Donetsk and Luhansk and Mariupol and uh, maybe in 
you know, on the front before I can speak. And of course, uh, uh, there's there's something to that. What what qualifies me to make any statements? Well, I think uh, I'm restricting myself. I'm not making judgments about military uh, conduct or accept uh, uh, the moral the moral side of it. The question of the just war. Um, and I think that um, in the same way that before the war, I was studying and writing about the Russian Orthodox, the Moscow Patriarchate in, in Russia, um, uh, and also churches in Ukraine. Um, for a time, I lived in Ukraine, but, but not in Russia. Uh, I have, you know, my personal experience on the ground in, in Ukraine, but, uh, but not during the war. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's what it is. I, I look forward to, um, again, to feedback from uh, all of you. If, if something occurs to you uh, afterwards, uh, you know, please take uh, the liberty to, uh, to share that. Um, I think um, this is, this is uh, a very, a very small, contribution to a very large uh, set of issues. And I, again, I want to thank uh, uh, all of you for, um, for joining me today and for um, um, helping me to uh, continue to think about these things, uh, which are uh, extremely serious, in some ways uh, painful, um, you know, uh, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of people who are concerned with their church, whatever, whichever church that is, uh, because of the war are, are torn by, by emotions and by trauma. And, um, and I, can, I can understand that even without being there because, because I feel uh, many of those uh, emotions myself. So um, I, I, I think I went on much longer than I, I intended, but... Um, uh, all of this to um, uh, to thank you so much for 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 joining me today. Uh, we thank you, Professor Grauzu, for uh, your excellent uh, speech. It was also a wonderful uh, discussion, like uh, Professor Davis noted. Um, definitely, we're going to see. We're going to take this in very serious consideration, especially your uh, seven points. I will be, with your permission, translate. I will translate them personally in Greek if. Uh, you give me the permission to do or the whole document, and let's say uh, it's uh, very, very useful also for yeah. us to, to understand a broader audience. Yeah, and uh, let's uh, I'd like to thank also cordially uh, Professor uh, Father Andrei Tuchenko and Professor Moscos uh, from Athens. And uh, let's uh, close uh, today's session with uh, again with the hope and the prayer that this uh, war. Uh, will end uh, soon and uh, we're going to again again uh, proceed to the road of uh, reconciliation and dialogue. Thank you all very much for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Once again. Okay. It's a pleasure.